On the 11th of January 2024, the world watched as hearings opened at the International Court of Justice on South Africa's claim that Israel has been committing genocide in Gaza. The case has sharply divided international opinion. While many states have lined up behind South Africa and the Palestinians, many others, especially in the West, have dismissed the claim against Israel. But what exactly does the case mean and what are the likely wider consequences of any decision. Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Kerlinsey and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. There's no greater crime than genocide. The willful extermination of a group, men, women, children, young and old, merely for who they are, provokes horror and disgust. As the UN General Assembly put it, it shocks the conscience of mankind. While history is full of acts of extermination, the term genocide was first coined in the 1940s as the Nazis pursued the extermination of the Jewish people in the Holocaust. In the years that followed, as the world sought to prevent such acts of mass murder from ever happening again, the UN General Assembly passed the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide on the 9th of December 1948. Entering into force three years later, the Convention defined genocide as acts intended to destroy, either in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. As well as killing, this also included causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of a group, deliberately inflicting conditions intended to bring about the group's destruction, measures to prevent births and forcibly transferring children to another group. Crucially, as well as the act of genocide, the Convention also made conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempting to commit genocide and complicity in genocide punishable acts. Moreover, as well as giving states the right to call on the UN to prevent or suppress acts of genocide, Article 9 of the Convention noted that disputes relating to the Convention, including the responsibility of a state for genocide or other punishable acts relating to genocide, should be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute. Based in The Hague in the Netherlands, the International Court of Justice comprises 15 judges elected by the UN General Assembly and the Security Council for nine-year terms. As the UN's principal legal body, the ICJ serves two distinct purposes. First, it provides legal advice to the United Nations. Known as advisory opinions, these can be made at the request of the General Assembly, the Security Council, the UN Secretariat, as well as the specialised agencies within the UN system. Secondly, the court can rule on issues brought by UN member states that accept the court's jurisdiction. While these will often focus on issues like border disputes and acts of aggression, as noted, it can also hear cases involving the Genocide Convention. Crucially, these cases can be brought by any of the 153 states that have ratified the Convention, regardless of whether they're directly involved in events or have a special interest. For example, in addition to the case brought by South Africa, the courts also hearing claims brought by Ukraine against Russia and the Gambia against Myanmar. Previous cases included Serbia and Croatia and Bosnia and Yugoslavia. However, it's important to note that the ICJ is not a criminal court. It deals solely with states. Responsibility for holding individuals accountable for genocide lies with national courts, special international courts or the International Criminal Court, the ICC, a wholly separate body. The roots of South Africa's case lie in the conflict that erupted in late 2023, following Hamas's brutal attack on Israel on the 7th of October that left 1,200 people dead and thousands wounded and saw several hundred people taken prisoner, Israeli forces launched a massive air operation against Gaza, followed by a ground invasion. Altogether, it's estimated that this has killed at least 23,000 Palestinians, including more than 7,000 children. Meanwhile, almost 2 million people have been displaced. On top of this, a total blockade on Gaza has led to severe shortages of food and medical supplies and disrupted electricity, water and communications. With the situation in Gaza 
now been called a humanitarian catastrophe by the UN Secretary General. There have been growing claims that Israel has gone beyond the realms of a legitimate operation to defeat Hamas. Instead, many argue that it's engaged in a deliberate policy to destroy the Palestinian people of the territory, a claim that's now seen the matter brought before the ICJ. Building on its long-standing support for the Palestinian, which is rooted in historic links between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and South Africa's ruling African National Congress, South Africa instituted proceedings against Israel under the Genocide Convention on the 29th of December 2023. It also called for the court to consider provisional measures, immediate steps to halt actions that may amount to genocide. Specifically, it argued that the acts threatened, adopted, condoned, taken and been taken by the government and military of the State of Israel are intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial and ethnical group. However, while many countries have lined up to support the South African case, many others have stood against the allegations. For example, the United States, Israel's key supporter, insisted that it hadn't seen any evidence of genocide. At the same time, other Western states have also argued that while Israel should act with restraint, its actions don't amount to a deliberate policy to exterminate the Palestinians. Meanwhile, other observers have argued that the case is essentially about politics and not law. On the 11th of January, the case got underway. South Africa opened the proceedings by outlining its allegations against Israel. Highlighting that Israel's military operations had led to the deaths of around 1% of the Palestinian population of Gaza, it argued that the operation had been carried out with such a complete disregard for the civilian population of Gaza that it amounted to a deliberate policy of extermination against the Palestinian people. On top of this, it insisted that the repeated statements made by Israeli politicians, including by the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as by figures in the media, amounted to an incitement to genocide. Taken altogether, it argued that Israel had shown a chilling and incontrovertible intent to commit genocide in Gaza. The next day, Israel had its chance to respond. Categorically rejecting the accusations of genocide, it called South Africa's claims a profoundly distorted view of the situation. Arguing that its invasion of Gaza was a legitimate and justified act of self-defense following Hamas's attack in October, it denied the accusations that its leaders had incited genocide, claiming that comments had been taken out of context. Moreover, it insisted that many of the deaths and injuries had been caused by Hamas, as well as using civilian buildings, including hospitals and schools, for military purposes. It argued that the group had laid mines and booby traps across Gaza, causing many buildings to collapse and leading to widespread civilian casualties. Israel also turned the tables on Hamas highlighting that the group's underlying ideology is the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. The Israeli legal team argued that Hamas was the party guilty of genocide and not Israel. Now that the oral arguments have been completed, the focus turns to what happens next. There are in fact two distinct parts to look out for. First of all, there's a request for provisional measures. This is where the court decides whether Israeli actions may indeed contravene the convention. If so, it may issue an order outlining steps Israel must take to stop this from happening. Given the seriousness of the situation and the pressing urgency to act, if it seems that Israel is indeed considered to be potentially violating the convention, this ruling is expected within the next few weeks. Secondly, there's the main ruling on whether Israel has violated the Genocide Convention. Unlike the call for provisional measures, this isn't expected anytime soon. Indeed, it may well take several years for the court to hand down a decision. Of course, the big question is what will happen if the court does rule against Israel. 
First, it must be emphasised that the court has no enforcement powers. While it has significant moral authority, it can't compel a state to abide by its rulings. However, it could open the way for further action at the United Nations, including resolutions in the Security Council or the General Assembly. Regarding any decision on provisional measures, the general view is that the Israeli government is likely to ignore anything that limits its operations in Gaza. It'll argue that it has a duty to its citizens to continue its campaign against Hamas until its goals have been achieved and the country's security can be guaranteed. Indeed, speaking on the 100th day since the start of the operation against Gaza, Prime Minister Netanyahu insisted that the campaign would continue until Israel had achieved total victory. Meanwhile, although any order for provisional measures would be a significant step in its own right, legal analysts have also suggested that it could also offer some early suggestions on the direction the court will take on the central question concerning Israel's alleged violation of the Genocide Convention. In this regard, it will certainly be something to watch. As for the main ruling, although this is potentially years away, Israel seems to be preparing the ground for its defence in the event that the court does indeed decide that it's committed genocide or otherwise violated the Genocide Convention. For example, Mark Regev, a senior advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu and a former Israeli government spokesman, has openly questioned the court's credibility. As well as pointing out that many of the justices come from countries with less than free judiciaries, he also asked how a Lebanese judge could rule in Israel's favour, knowing the consequences this could have on his return to Lebanon. This seems to suggest that Israel is readying the ground to reject any ruling from the court that it has committed genocide by claiming it's a politically motivated decision. Nevertheless, if the court does decide that Israel has violated the convention, it will face colossal damage to its reputation and standing on the world stage. The implications for a country forged by genocide will be nothing less than profound. But in many ways, if the court does rule against Israel, either on provisional measures or the central allegations, the more significant challenge will be for those countries that support Israel rather than Israel itself. They'll be caught in a difficult bind. On the one hand, do they condemn Israel and are forced to support measures against it? Or do they reject the court's decision, arguing that it's politically motivated, thus undermining the legitimacy and standing of the ICJ, the world's highest court and the principal legal organ of the United Nations? At a time when international law is under unprecedented challenge, this would mark yet another dangerous step away from the established order that's underpinned the international system for the last 80 years. But as crucial as the genocide case is, it isn't the only case Israel is facing concerning Palestine at the ICJ. Here's a video examining the legal implications of its long-term occupation of the West Bank that could determine the very future of a Palestinian state. 